I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back. Now, today we're going to look at one of my favorite subjects, gynecology and TCM. Wow, Chinese medicine is amazing when it comes to women's health. Over the years, I have helped many, many patients going through fertility issues, pregnancy problems, induction, cervical ripening, going through menopause, which that's my turn. I'm going through that right now. Not too bad so far. I'm keeping things leveled and balanced. Hopefully, uh, this continues using Chinese medicine as my favorite tool. So with no further ado, I wanted you to enjoy this course. It's going to be a three part. I like to break it down so it's not too much. You know me. And it is really the basics of how Chinese medicine sees the woman's body and how to treat it. So you're going to look at treatment. You're going to be able to use those tools to make a difference in your patient's lives. And by the way, yes, I am matching the PowerPoint colors again today. This is going to be my trademark. I'm wearing the pink. Let's enjoy together. Let's get it started. So we're going to look during this course at the introduction of specifically gynecology and TCM, the woman's physiology, and we're going to compare men and women to give us an idea of how TCM sees the woman's body versus the men's body. And then we'll look at menstruation and how we use acupuncture and herbs to treat uh, menstruation and to regulate it in general as a basic. Conception, of course, fertility, pregnancy. Yeah, that's a great one. TCM acupuncture works so well for pregnancies. I've done it many times. It's so much fun to help people with issues without having to take drugs. Menopause, I'm going through that right about now. <laughs> and uh, I'm managing it very well. So I'm pretty pleased with the way TCM works. We're going to look at the causes of imbalance in the woman's physiological body and what happens when things are not properly working and hormones, specifically reproductive hormones, are not working. And then we'll look at prevention and how TCM has great pearls to help women prevent issues when it comes to their body. So let's look at the physiological part of women versus men in TCM. And did you see how I put a capital letter in the women, but not in the men? It's because, you know, my husband would not be pleased. I think women are just smarter. Ow! <laughs> um, let's look at women versus men in TCM. So women are more yin in general. So they're going to be much more related to blood and men are more young. So they're going to be much more related to chi and have more chi issues like liver yang rising coming from liver chi stagnation. Women are going to have tendency to have more blood stasis or blood deficiency. So that's the first difference. The second difference is men are going to be rooted in number eight and women are going to be rooted in number seven. So in Chinese medicine, the, um, men and women have a number that's going to go through their life. And I'm going to explain that. But before we do that, I just wanted to say that Chinese people believe number eight is a very lucky number. It must have been a man making that rule. But in the Western world, for people that are superstitious, seven is the lucky number. So everybody wins. So what does that mean in TCM and in physiological part of men and women? It means that as a child, a woman is seven. And then you double that. She'll be a teenager at 14, while a man will be a teenager at 16. So we usually say a 14-year-old girl is at the same level of a 16-year-old boy. And if you remember being in high school, you know what I mean, right? If you are remembering that time, girls were much more mature than boys in high school, right? So at 14, they kind of compare to the 16-year-old boys. When we add up again, so seven by three is 21 and eight by three is 24. This is in Chinese medicine when it is okay to start basically conceiving uh, and it is okay for men and women to have children. But also that means that this is the end of their growth. They are done with growing and this is the part of adulthood. So it means that if we're gonna have to conceive and we wanna conceive a child, anything younger, specifically for the woman, if we conceive a child at 16, 17, 18, it takes a toll on the body because it is not quite 
formed completely. So it's a little bit difficult and it'll be really hard on the woman's body. It's less for the men, obviously. Then we're going to have seven by four, which is 28 years old. In Chinese medicine, 28 years old for women and eight by four, which would be 32 for men, is the best time to have children to conceive. And it's really when the women and the men are the strongest in the reproductive years. So I give you an idea. Then we go from seven multiplied by five, and that is 35 for women, which in Chinese medicine means that's it. This is when you should stop having children. Nowadays, a lot of women have kids in their 40s or late 30s. It is not impossible. It's actually very common, but it does take a little bit of a toll on the woman, and it's definitely harder for the pregnancy than if someone is uh, before or under 35. For the men, it's going to be 40. So 40, up to 40, the sperm is great quality everything is fine so this is again you know a good time to have children after that again it's just numbers right those are numbers that can be played with because a woman at 35 it could be that she is 35 but really because she had such a good lifestyle throughout and good constitution and good essence to start with she probably is a maybe a 30 year old right but a 35 year, year old years old woman sorry that is had bad lifestyle lots of alcohol cigarettes bad diet bad sleep a lot of stress at 35 she may be actually older than what her numbers are hopefully that makes sense um when you look at women definitely when we go to 49 which if you calculate, you know, you keep calculating and multiplying, seven by seven is 49. That's when menopause should start and when the change in a woman's life will start. For men, it would be the same idea. So eight by seven, which is 56, this is when men should definitely not reproduce anymore. Um, not that they can't, but the sperm quality is not as good. And again, it depends on their lifestyle. So I think it's kind of fun to look at those numbers always, right? Kind of to remind us, and it's very close to Western medicine and how Western medicine sees it. Now, when it comes to organs, the woman's definitely very much related to spleen, liver, kidney, and heart. Spleen, because spleen produces blood. Liver stores blood for menstruation. So that's a whole blood relationship. Kidney, because obviously kidney is part of the root, the essence. So in order for our reproductive system to work properly, we need good essence to start with, or even to conceive, we need good essence, right? And heart, because heart is in charge of blood circulation. So the more or the better our blood circulation, the more everything's going to flow much better. With men, it's much more related to liver and kidney. So when men have issue with, let's say, fertility or reproductive organs or erection issues, it can only be two things, or a kidney essence deficiency, so there's a really deficiency in the kidneys, or a liver that has been overstressed and that's probably stagnated. That's much easier to treat. Then... When it comes to meridians, we're going to use a lot of points that are related to the Chong, the Ren, and the Dai meridian specifically for women. The Ren is the Yin meridian. It's really the fertility, the conception vessel. That's the translation, right? The Chong is the one that carries blood and essence, and the Dai is the girdle that holds them all together. So also very good to prevent prolapse, specifically after children. When it comes to men, the Du meridian, which is the most young meridian, because it's in the back of all extraordinary meridian, is what we can use a lot um, as extraordinary meridian. Remember the extraordinary meridian carry essence. So they are really good to help when it comes to fertility, for example, right? And then of course, woman is connected to the uterus as the extraordinary organ, the king of our organ, the uterus. <laughs> While men are related to the dantian, which really is a space uh, below the belly button, above the pubic symphysis bone, where really their essence is held in place for them, and hopefully they have extra. So let's start with menstruation and TCM. So from now on, it's all a woman's world. We're not talking about men anymore. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right, so when it comes to menstruation, the menarche, uh, I never know if we say menarche or menarche, not quite sure, you know, 
English is not my first language. So the onset should be as a normal onset between 12 to 15 years old. So when I ask patient, when was your first period? And they tell me that it was at age 10 or 11. That means that there is a spleen deficiency and that's why it happened. Nowadays, more and more girls are having their periods so early, like eight, nine, 10. And I think personally, maybe because there's a lot of hormones put in our food, specifically in the dairy and the meat that most people consume and that might affect, um, you know, through the digestion, which is spleen, um, our reproductive system. And the other side is if the period is later, uh, meaning 16, 17, 18, I actually had a patient the other day that came to see me and she never had a period and she was 29 and her doctor is not concerned until she decided to want children. I was just floored. I couldn't believe that. So that was quite a shock to me. So the later, the more kidney deficiency we have to be aware of, right? When it comes to menstruation, a 26 to 32 day cycle is considered normal. So it should last about four to six days, the period, right? If it lasts a day, it's too short. If it lasts 10 days and it keeps trickling or spotting, that's not long enough. If a cycle, of course, is 23 days or 40 days, that's too short or too long, we need to regulate and rebalance the whole reproductive system. So if the blood is darker at first, then deep red, then finishes off lighter at the end without clots, without pain, without cramp, that's your perfect menstruation. So, and on top of it, to finish off, yes, no PMS. <laughs> In Chinese medicine, the perfect period should be that length of a cycle. It should last about four to six days. The blood flow should be perfect and then no PMS and no symptoms. So not all people experience that, but I've had had some patients that are exactly like this, which is fantastic. When it comes to menopause, the onset should be, again, this is the number seven, right? So from 42 to 56 should be when it starts and when it kind of finishes, right? So 49 is usually around the middle part of it. And then hopefully by 56, the person is done. If it's earlier, like someone goes through menopause and at 35, then that's a blood deficiency for sure. If it's later, there's definitely fire that has actually come down to the kidney, making the kidney yin deficient with excess fire. So if someone has a menopause at like 60, for example. All right, so let's look at the uterus and the organ relationship in TCM. When it comes to spleen, spleen produces blood. When we have good nutrients, the nutrients are transformed and transported into blood. So we have a good menstruation. Also that blood can transform into breast milk later on for women that are gonna feed the babies after pregnancy. It also keeps the uterus in place, meaning spleen remembers in charge of raising chi and keeping all the organs from prolapsing. So that's also very interesting because if someone is flooding, has very, very heavy menstruation, gushing, that could be a spleen not being able to hold the blood within the blood vessel. So remember that as well as a function of spleen. Liver moves chi and stores blood for menstruation. When we have a lot of PMS, often it's because qi is stagnated. We are very stressed or whatever the cause is, we need to move qi gently, so hopefully we have a better outcome and less PMS. Also, if there is blood deficiency, it could be that the liver cannot store extra blood. So that could be due to stress, right? We can really go, go, go all the time and not being able to have enough blood saved. And then we have amenorrhea or very, very light, uh, short cycle. So kidney stores essence, of course, and essence will be more used when it's time for fertility, conception, pregnancy, all that jazz. Heart is in charge of blood circulation. So good menstruation flow is very important. And if it's not, if there's a lot of blood stasis, let's look at heart, but also at liver because chi moves blood. So if there is a blood stasis, maybe it's due to stress and liver didn't move chi first, right? Or it could be a heart issue. Stomach 
connects to the uterus via the Chong meridian through the breastfeeding. So the Chong meridian, if you remember the way it is, it really goes along the stomach and spleen meridian, connect to both those meridians and some of those points. So definitely when there is issue of breastfeeding, we have to look at the stomach meridian. That's gonna help us figure things out. All right, so let's look now at the uterus and the extraordinary meridians. So as I said earlier, all extraordinary meridians carry essence, while the regular meridians carry chi and blood. So we're gonna use a lot of the extraordinary meridian point to treat women's disorders. The Ren is the C of all yin meridians. It's in the front and it's called a conception vessel, so you understand it controls hormones, the uterus, the vagina, and definitely anything that has to do with the reproductive system. The confluential point of the Ren meridian, meridian sorry, is long seven. So we are gonna use long seven a lot and of course Ren points as well. The Du meridian is the sea of all young meridian. It controlled the Mingmen fire and that's going back to foundation uh, and diagnosis in TCM, specifically foundation. The Mingmen fire is what's really in between our kidneys. It's what is controlling our life or vitality. Sometimes it's called the vitality gate, the vitality fire, right? So it keeps the uterus nice and warm, specifically for conception, to grow a baby. I always say, if you're gonna grow a baby, you need an oven, right? It needs to be warm, not a fridge. Uh, so often for conception, we want a nice warm uterus. And the confluential point of the Dumeridian is more intestine three, so we may use that as well often. One we're gonna use a lot is spleen four because the Chong meridian is the sea of blood. That is really, really a meridian that we're gonna use a lot when there is blood deficiency or blood stasis affecting the reproductive system in a patient because it really, really controls all aspect of the menstruation. So if you have someone with amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, whatever the pattern is, if there is a blood issue, you need to use spleen four. The dimeridian, as I said earlier, is the girdle that really binds all meridian. And in doing that, it also helps keep the uterus in place with the spleen, right? So it kind of keeps everything up from basically sagging down. Boy, I need a dye meridian now. <laughs> um, it also controls the external genitalia. So we're gonna use the confluential point, gallbladder 41, a lot more when there are external genitalia issues, such as vulvodynia, uh, outbreak of maybe gen genital herpes, any kind of problem that's affecting that area, or even like a yeast infection that's very itchy and painful and burning, definitely gallbladder 41 is gonna be a great point to do. All right, so now, next we're gonna look at the basic TCM diagnosis for menstruation, because we need to have the right diagnosis, right? So the blood color, we said earlier, should be nice and red, but if it's really bright red and flooding, it's probably heat in the blood. If it's very pink or very light, that could be a blood deficiency. Purple, always blood stasis. Anything purple is blood stasis, right? Dark burgundy, that sounds like my favorite wine. Uh, <laughs> that's usually blood stasis with also some internal cold. So as we move the blood, we will have to try to warm the person to scatter and break the ice, right? Crimson red is gonna be a yin deficiency. Crimson red is that dark red. That's one of my favorite color, I love that color. What not, obviously not for yin deficiency, but I like that color. And then watery blood, where it's just almost like gushing water, that's usually a young deficiency, no fire, right? So no color. When it comes to the consistency, we want a good flow. So if there's clots, that means that obviously there is issues. Dark large clot is blood stasis. And when I mean large, you gotta have to ask your patient, what do they think is large? Because it's all relative to what we know. A few years ago, I had a patient and I said, oh, do you have clots? And she said, yes. I said, well, are they large? And she said, no. I said, okay, give me a fruit. Like, is it like 
you know, a grape, a raisin, an apricot. And she goes, no, the size of a peach. <laughs> so to her, that wasn't big because she was used to it. To me, a peach size clot is massive. So I'm sorry, I use fruit all the time. I know it's not fun, but that's the easiest way I can think of uh, trying to relate. So um, dark, small, tiny clots are gonna be blood stasis with cold, and again, internal cold. But if they are stringy, more stringy, long clots, that's due to damp or phlegm, all right? The pain, ah, the pain. So if someone has a pain, like dysmenorrhea or painful cramps, before the menstruation is a cheese stagnation. Like if they have it at PMS, that's a cheese stagnation, very easy to get rid of. If they have it at the beginning of the menstruation, like the first day, it's the worst day, oh my God, the first day is the worst day, I'm in so much pain, then I feel better, that's a blood stasis. If that's at the end, I have patients I will say, no, I have nothing, and in the last two days, it's really cramping, even though the flow may not be that heavy. So that's usually a blood deficiency. Think of beginning is always excess, end is always deficiency. And of course, if the pain is better on heat, that means that there is internal cold, right? Which creates blood stasis because cold congeal and stop blood from circulating. Mild pain, like kind of like an ache, but I can handle it. That's a yin or blood deficiency. And if there's pain during ovulation, I always ask that question, you know, is there pain at mid cycle during ovulation on one side? Because obviously when the egg descends, if there is some kind of cyst or some issue in there, it's going to be painful. And that usually, obviously, if there's a cyst, that would be damp and phlegm. Now let's look at the basic treatment principle for menstruation in TCM. During the menses, so if we look at the four phase cycle, let's say someone has a perfect regular cycle, we want to move blood if there is light bleeding to try to get a bit more bleeding out of it or we want to stop bleeding if the menstruation is too heavy. The next week after that, we want to nourish the blood because we lost some so we need to replenish it and we want to nourish kidney yin to prepare for the ovulation or mid-cycle phases, which could be between day 14 to day 20, depending on the person. So some people can ovulate a bit earlier as well. We're gonna nourish essence, tonify and warm kidney yang, making sure we have a lot of fire in there, and then harmonize the chong and the ren meridian. How are we gonna do all this? It's coming. I'm gonna talk about it right following this slide. The pre-menses or the PMS time, before the period, we just want to gently move liver chi. Most of us get a lot of chi stagnation at that time, so that's a perfect time to do so. The only thing I wanted to say is if we're going to do treatment, we do not want to induce sweating during menstruation because it's too strong of a treatment. So if you like to recommend infrared saunas, to your patient, uh, it shouldn't be done while we're bleeding. So maybe the other three weeks would be perfect, but not during the bleeding time. Okay, so we were talking about treatment. Then let's look at the basic treatment principle for menstruation in TCM. So as I was saying, during the menses, you wanna move blood or stop bleeding, right? If you move blood, then something like liver three, spleen eight and spleen six is gentle enough to move blood, did you see I did not put large intestine four. I don't wanna induce a flood, I just wanna gently move blood. Also, obviously, if someone is bleeding profusely, you wanna bleed spleen one. Spleen one is the best point to stop uterine bleeding, right? Spleen eight is actually really good in trying to rebalance the flow, and it's the best point for cramps. So, you win on both counts. The next week after that, we want to replenish the blood and the yen of kidney. So that's when we're going to start using the confluent point of all the extraordinary meridian. Remember we talked about long seven, sorry, and spleen four earlier, long seven being the confluent point of the ren meridian and spleen four being the confluent point of the chong meridian. We're gonna pair those with kidney six and pericardium six, which are also confluent point of extraordinary meridian. We'll look at this combination a little bit later more in depth, but right, left, right, left gives you one on the right wrist, one on the left wrist, one on the right ankle, and one on the left 
ankle or foot, right? Plus, we're going to obviously nourish blood with stomach 36 and spleen 6 and liver 8 specifically for the liver. During the ovulatory cycle, we are going to do the four points again that are really a good combination to rebalance hormones, replenish blood, and prepare for ovulation. So again, we're doing exactly the same thing we did the week before, but on top of it, we're going to add up stomach 29 because it's a very good point to worm the uterus. We also could add up REN4 if we wanted to tonify kidney yang a lot more if the person was really, really depleted, right? The way we harmonize Chong and REN Meridian is by using those four points, specifically spleen 4 and long 7. And then, of course, during the pre-period week, we want to gently move liver chi and calm the person from the stress. So we can do the four gates to open the flow of chi, LI4, liver 3. Spleen 6 is actually a really good point to balance hormones, and it's gently moving for liver chi. And, of course, we can calm the mind by using yin tong and ear shenman. Okay, so now let's look at the formulas or herbal formulas uh, during those four phases. During the menstruation, we usually don't use any formula, or if it has to be, it would be very gentle. So it's good to take a break during that period of time, right? Maybe for a week. For the post menses, we want to tonify and nourish blood. Remember, we said that, right? So we have three different formulas we can choose from. Subutong, Bajantong, and Guipitong. The difference, I'm going to have a whole course on differentiating formula, but I wanted to say that Suwutong is more for liver and heart blood deficiency. Bajantong is more if there's a spleen and liver deficiency of blood. And then Guipitong is more if there is heart and liver blood deficiency. So we're going to have to choose the right one at that time, right? So I love Suwutong. It's one of my favorite ones. But uh, we'll go in depth in the herbal and formula class later on ovulation cycle. We have two major formula that are really, really specifically good to tonify kidney essence, kidney yin and kidney yang. The first one, your gui one, is more for someone that is more kidney yang deficiency because your gui means right nourishing, while zuo gui means left nourishing and left side is more yin side. So Zuo Gui Wan is better for a person that's more on the yin deficiency side, even though both can tonify yin and yang of kidney. And then pre-menstruation, we have two formula, Chai Hu Shu Gan San, which is great for people that are liver chi stagnated, Xia Yao San, which is again for liver chi stagnation, but with also some spleen deficiency, like craving, bloating, fatigue, right? That's a little bit more than just a chi stagnation. All right, I hope you're enjoying this. I have done the menstruation treatment. Really, really use it in your practice. The last thing I wanted to do today before we finish off part one, <laughs> boy, there's a lot to talk about on the woman's body. I wanted to talk about vaginal discharge in general, which, you know, we should have, obviously. But I want to look at the difference to know what's going on if someone has very thick, white, vaginal discharge. That's usually a damp cold or a cold. If it's watery, really watery, then that's a yang deficiency, okay? And it's pretty clear in general. If someone has yellow discharge, it could be a yeast infection, right? So that would be damp heat or plain heat, depending. It probably is a bit smelly as well. If it's green, that's damp heat in the liver. That's not good. That's starting to become a bit toxic. And so we have to start detoxify. And if it's yellow with pus and smelly, sorry, and with some red tinged, uh, that's definitely toxic heat. So that is much more stronger treatment that we would have to require. We'll look at this a little bit more later on. Again, for the consistency, if it is watery, it's more damp, cold, or young deficiency, uh, definitely more young deficiency the more water it is. The thicker it is, the more cold it would be. Okay, And I can be in between the two with kind of like a damp cold. If it's thick and sticky, like really thick, then that's always damp heat. And if there's no smell, it's due to cold. And if there's strong smell, then it means there's excess heat. Wow, that was 
a lot of information, more than 30 minutes, and we only did part one. In part two and three, we're going to look at conception, fertility, uh, pregnancy, and menopause. The woman's body is an unbelievable wonderland. <laughs> Well, if you love it, remember, share it. Make sure somebody else benefits from the information and can help their patients as well. I hope you have a fantastic day. I'll see you in the next video. And remember again, let's together make a dent in the universe by helping one patient at a time. Have a great day.